Good morning, everyone. To be back with Harry Potter and the Three Handles by J.K. Rowling. Last time I finished at page 82. Let's continue. No, said one. Before Harry could answer, so does it say how to destroy Hogwarts in that book? Yes, yeah, said Hermione. Now turning the federal page, pages as if examining um, exam, examining rotten trills. Because it warns dark wizards how strong they have to make their enchantment, enchantments on them. From all that I've read that Harry did to Riddle's diary was one of those few really foolproof ways of destroying Horcrux. While stabbing with, the, with the, it with a basilisk fan? Asked Harry. Oh well, lucky if we've got such a um, large supply of that basilisk fan. Then said Ron. I was wondering what we were going to do with them. It does have to be a basilisk fan, said Hermione patiently. It has to be something destructive that the Horcrux can repair itself. Basilisk venom only has one antidote, and it's incredibly rare. Phoenix tears, said Harry, nodding. Um, exactly, said Hermione. Our problem is that there are very few substances as destructive as um, basilisk venom, and they are all very dangerous to carry around with you. That's a problem we're going to have to solve, though, because ripping, uh, smashing, or crushing a Horcrux won't do the trick. You've got to put it beyond a magical repair, but even if we wreck the thing, it lives on, it lives in, said Ron. Why can't the bit of soul in it just go and live in something else? Because a Horcrux is the complete opposite of a human being. Seeing that Harry and Ron looked thoroughly confused, um, Hermione and Harry down. Look, if I picked up a sword right now, Ron and I ran through with it, I would have damaged your soul at, at all. Which would be a real comfort to me, I'm sure, said Ron. Harry laughed. It should be, actually, but my point is that whatever happens to your body, your soul will survive untouched, said Hermione. But it's the other way around with Horcruxes. The fragment of soul inside it depends on its container, its enchanted body. For survival, it can't exist without it. The diary sort of di died when I stabbed it, said Harry, remembering ink pouring like blood from the punctured pages and the screams of the piece of Voldemort's soul as it vanished. And words of the diary was properly destroyed. The bit of soul trapped in it could no longer exist. Ginny tried to get rid of the diary before you did, flushing it away, but obviously it came back good as new. Hang on, said Ron, frowning. The bit of soul in the diary was processing um, Ginny, wasn't it? How does that work then? While the magical container is still intact, the bit of soul, soul inside it can fill, flit and out of someone if they get too close to the object. I don't mean um, holding it for too long. Um, holding it for too long is nothing to do with touching it, she added. She added, holding wrong, could speak. I mean, close emotionally. Ginny poured her heart out, out into the diary. She made herself incredibly vulnerable. You're in trouble if you get too fond of or dependent on um, um, the Horcrux. I wonder how Dumbledore destroyed the ring, said Harry. Why didn't I ask him? I never really, his voice tra tailed away. He was thinking of all the different things he should have asked Dumbledore. And of course, uh, since the headmaster had died, it seemed to Harry that he had wasted so many opportunities when Dumbledore had been alive to find out more, to find out everything. The silence was shattered as the bedroom door flew open with a well cra shaking crash. Hermione shrieked and dropped the secret of the dark art. Crookshank shrieked under the bed, hissing indignantly. Ron jumped off the bed, skidded on the discarded chocolate frog wrapper and his wand before realizing that he was looking up at Mrs. Weasley, whose hair was disheveled and whose face was contorted with the rage. I'm so sorry to, to break up the cozy little gathering, she said, her voice trembling. I'm sure you will. You all need your rest, but then a wedding present stacked in my room that needs sorting out, and I was under the impression that you had agreed to help. Oh, yes, said Hermione, um, looking terrified as she left to her feet, sending books flying in every direction. We will. We, we're sorry. 
with them. An anguished look at Harry and Ron and Hermione hurried out of the room after Mrs. Weasley. It's been, it's like being a house elf, complained Ron in the undertone, still ma managing his head as he and Harry followed, um, except um, without the jump satisfaction. The sooner this wedding over, the happier I will be. Yeah, said Harry. Then, uh, we'll, then we'll have nothing to do except find Horcruxes. It'll be, it'll be like a holiday, won't it? Ron started to laugh, but at the sight of the enormous pile of the wedding presents waiting for them in the Mrs. Weasley's room, stopped quiet abruptly. The the Lacours arrived at the following morning at eleven o'clock. Um, Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Ginny were feeling quite resentful towards Flo's family by this time, and it was with an ill grace that Ron stumped to Flo's family by this time. But it but back upstairs to put up an a ma a matching sock, and Harry accepted to <coughs> flatten his hair. Once they had all been deemed smart enough. They strooped, um, they strooped out into the sunny backyard to await the visitors. Harry had never seen the place looking so tiny. The rusty cauldrons and the old Wellington moose that usually littered the steps by the back door were gone, replaced by two new uh, fluttered by bushes standing either side of the door in a large pot. Though there was, so, there was no breeze, the leaves waved it lazily, giving an attractive rippling effect. The chickens had been shut away, the yards had been uh, swept, and the nearby nearby garden, who had pu um, pu pruned, um, plucked, and generally spruced up, although Harry, who liked it in its overgrown state, thought that it would rather flow uh, forlorn um, without its usually contingent of capering gnomes. He had lost track of how many security intentments that had been placed upon the borough by both of the ministry and the order members. All he knew that was that it was no longer possible for anybody to travel by magic directly into the place. Mr. Weasley had therefore gone to meet um, the other course on the top of the nearby hill, where they were to arrive by the port key. The first sign of their approach was an unusually high-pitched laugh, um, which turned out to be from Mr. Mr. Weasley, who appeared to... At the gate, moments later, laden with luggage and leading a beautiful blonde lady in long leaf green robes, who could only buy Flo's mother. Mama! cried um, Flo, rushing forward to embrace her. Papa! Monsieur Delacour was um, nowhere near as attractive as his wife. He was uh, a head shorter and extremely plump, with a little pointed black beard. Um, some, some, um, however, he looked good-natured, belting towards Mrs. Weasley in high-heeled boots. He um, kissed her uh, twice on each cheek, and uh, li um, leaving her flustered. You've never been to much trouble, he said in a deep voice. Floor tells us you have been working very hard. Oh, 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 it's, it's been nothing, um, um, trilled Mrs. Weasley. No trouble at all. Ron relieved his feelings by aiming a kick at a gnome who was peering out from be behind one of the new flutterbound bushes. There, lady, said um, uh, Monsieur, uh, Monsieur Delacour, still holding Mrs. Weasley's beto hand between his own um, two plump ones and beaming. You are most honored at the reporting onion of our two families. Let me present my wife, Apolline. Um, Madame Delacour glided forward and stooped to kiss Mrs. Um, Weasley, too. And Chanty, she said, uh, your husband has been um, telling us much amusing stories. Mr. Weasley gave a man um, initial laugh. Mrs. Weasley threw him a look, um, upon which he became immediately silent and assumed an um, expression appropriate to sick bed of a close friend. And of course, you have met my little daughter, Gabriel, said Monsieur Delacour. Gabriel was a floor in miniature, eleven years old, with waist length, the hair of pure um, silvery bond. She gave Mrs. Weasley a dazzling smile and hugged her, then threw Halley a glowing look and matting her eyelashes. Jenny cleared her throat loudly. Well, come in, come in, you, said. With Mrs. Weasley breathy, and she ushered the Delacours into the house. With many no pleases, 
and after you and not adults. The Delacours and soon transpired were helpful, pleasant guys. The, they were pleased with everything and keen to assist with the preparations for the wedding. Monsieur Delacour pronounced everything from the seating plan to the bridesmaid shoes uh, charmant. Um, Madame Delacour was most accomplished at the household spells and that the oven properly cleaned in a trice. Gabriel followed her elder sister um, around, trying to assist in any way she could and um, jabbering away in rapid French. On the downside, the borough was not built so accompanying. So many people, Mr. and Mrs. Weasley, were now sleeping in the um, sitting room. Um, having started down, Mrs. and Miss, Mrs. Monsieur and da Madame de la Cour's pro um, protest and insisted um, they take their bedroom. Gabriel was sleeping with Flo in Percy's old room. And Bill would be sharing with Charlie and his best man. Once Charlie arrived with from Romania, opportunities to make plans together uh, became uh, virtually non-existent, and it was in de desperation that Harry, Ron, and Hermione took to volunteering uh, to feed the chickens uh, just to escape the overcrowded house. But she still won't leave us alone," snarled Ron, as the second attempt at the meeting in the yard was foiled by the appearance of Mrs. Weasley carrying large by basket of laundry in her arm. Oh, good, you fed the kitchen, chickens, she called us as she approached them. We'd better shut them away again before the men arrives tomorrow to put up the tent for the wedding. She explained the cause to lean against the hen house. She looked exhausted. Millam and uh, Magic Marcus, they're very good, Bill's escorting them, escorting them. You'd better stay inside while um, they're here. Harry, I must uh, say it does um, complicate organizing a wedding, having all these security spells around this place. I I'm sorry, said Harry Bump humbly. Oh, don't be silly, dear, said Mrs. Weasley at once. I didn't mean well. Your safety is much more important. Actually, I, I've been wanting to ask you how you want to celebrate your birthday, Harry. Seventeen, after all, and it's an important day. I, I want to want a fuss, said Harry quickly, and investigating the, investigating the additional strain this would uh, put on them all. Um, really, Mrs. Weasley. Oh, just a normal dinner would be fine. It's it's the day before the wedding. Oh, well, if you're sure, dear, I'll invite Remus and Tom, shall I? And how about Hagrid? The, uh, that'll be great, said Harry. But please don't get loads of trouble. Not at all, not at all. It's no trouble. She looked at him. He. She looked at him. A long, searching look, then smiled a little sadly, straightening up and walked up away. Harry watched as she waved her wand near the washing line, and the damp clothes rose into the air to hang themselves up. And suddenly, he felt a great wave of remorse for the inconvenience of the pain he he was giving her. Well, I think we'll leave it here for tomorrow. Um, chapter seven: The Will of Albus Dumbledore, on page eighty-eight. Bye.